thank you so much for coming out. I'm Meg Mott. Um, and this is my last semester teaching at Marlboro. Oh. It's a big deal. Um, I will be going back to finish up with my plan students. But um, when uh, Libby and Myra, Myra first called me to ask if I wanted to do Osher. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be a hard semester because it's a big transition. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be filled with sadness because, and it's for good reasons that I'm retiring. But still, it was bittersweet. And I thought, I'll go to Osher. I will feel that excitement about teaching and also learning with people. And um, so the fact that I'm retiring, I'm actually hoping to do more of just these sort of things um, around the country, talking about politics in a good way and talking about the Bill of Rights. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, yeah. So besides thanking Myra and Libby for inviting me to this very, very precious time, it's great for me to be able to be at Osher. I'd also like to thank, thank uh, Janice Chilo and M. Richards, I think I mispronounced the name, who are going to be filming this. So, um, um, so this will be wonderful for the community and, and tell your friends about it. Uh, this is a labor of love for me, to be able to talk about politics in a good way. Um, let's see. And the other th person I wanted to thank is Jerry Stockman. The fact that you can hear me right now, is that true? Yes. Is because of Jerry Stockman. Can you see me right now? Yes. That's also because of Jerry Stockman. <laughs> so um, he's, he's been so important in helping us prepare this space in order to uh, make it possible for you all to hear and see and also for the camera work to happen. I am dressed for Machiavelli. <laughs> Machiavelli is one of my favorite political theorists. I love Machiavelli because he has no illusions about human nature. He sees us as we are, not as we're supposed to be. So one school of thought in political theory, and before we get into good clash, I, w I wanted to give you a backdrop because today's talk is going to have a bunch of political theorists in them. And I see two schools of thought. One of them is Machiavelli. He says what he sees, and what he sees is a little disappointing. <laughs> However, we can get better. And then there's another school of thought, which is Aristotle, which if I really was good with the quick change, I could put on a toga or something. And Aristotle believes that human beings are natural and that nature makes nothing in vain. So embedded in our DNA, we have the capacity to become better. So political theory sees the potential for angels and that we are actually quite devilish. <laughs> and we're going to be looking at that a lot over the course of this six weeks together. Opportunities for us to see our better angels and the reality when we screw up. And then what we do when we start to get uncomfortable. Because uh, human beings are quite adept at finding all sorts of reasons why things are going badly except for anything I've done something we can count on. Um, and we're going to spend more about uh, on that particular psychological gift that we have next class. Today we're going to talk about it mainly just in terms of political theory. Um, so good clash, it's a term I came up with based on Machiavelli and uh, it suggests that when there is clash it's better than when there is no clash. So I'm curious, I'm throwing it out to you early and uh, if, you, if you say something I'm going to need to have to repeat it. So um, I may con condense sometimes some of the things you're saying. But has anybody seen a good clash lately? <laughs> a good clash. In the back, yes. And can you remind me your name? It begins with a J? Yes, it's Jesse. Jesse. I, I think we're starting to see a little return of protest in a movement. So protest. Uh, Jesse is saying that some, he's seeing a return of protest in a movement. Is that what you said? What, what was, is there an example? Well, if it's a movement, it's not as fragmented or isolated or divided into different topics. Ah, 
but there are a lot of small, big topics, right? So Jesse is saying that if it's a movement, there shouldn't be any sort of disagreement. Is that right? Yeah. And that then if we have a protest movement, then that means the people within the movement are agreeing. Yes, yeah, so Jesse's got a great smile on his face. I wish you could see it, because I'm going to keep pushing on him a little bit more. Um, is that a clash, Jesse? If people are all agreeing? Well, there's not somebody, there's somebody we're not agreeing with. Oh, okay, so the protest element is creating the good clash. Yeah, okay, so there, there's an example of a good clash. I'm going to go, I got th three hands up um, over there, and I forget your name. Sheldon? Sheldon? Okay. Uh, adolescents around the world. Oh, adolescents around the world, Sheldon is saying. Why, what makes you say that, Sheldon? Because they're trying to do something about climate change, global warming. So uh, Sheldon is talking about adolescents around the world who, there you have the adolescents who are saying, stop it, you grown-ups, you have messed up the planet, and we want you to do something differently. So that could be a good clash. And it's a little like Jesse's in that it's a, it's a confrontation between two worldviews. Yeah, I'll take one more. Shoshana. Uh, I'm thinking of the recent statements by the Muslim legislator from Minnesota whose name escapes me at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and she made comments about having to do with U.S. policy towards Israel. And boy, that set off a firestorm, which surprised me that, that the, the heat on uh -huh. the uh, opposing her, yeah. but then other people of equal, you know, political stature or at least fame uh, stepped forward and joined in. Anyway, right. it's just been an interesting, yeah. I think it's an important clash. Clash. clash for our country to have. Yeah, so Shoshana has just talked about the incident that happened when a representative from Minnesota tweeted something that, had, that was perceived as very anti-Semitic. And, and so from that, there was a response, a, a whole bunch that Shoshana is talking about. So that all of a sudden, something starts to go, we go at an event, and we start hearing multiple voices about it. Um, Shoshana, and I'm sorry, Jesse, and I'm sorry, Sheldon, is going to get, like, yes from me because because it, we got multiple perspectives. It didn't turn into just one position and an anti-position. So protest may move us there, but it, what I'm really, really interested in is when we start to get more and more voices out there, and then we get something that is closer to an orchestra than competing marching bands. So, but you may disagree. Um, I want to also say, that you're very brave to come to this series. <laughs> Incredibly brave. Because um, as my mother would tell you if she were still alive, I tend to look for the most delicate subjects. And then I want to focus on them again and again and again. And I feel that that can either be a totally annoying, especially if you just want to go about your life, and I'm going to bring up something, not because I have a clear viewpoint on it, but because I want to hear all the sides on it. Um, and I've picked three that are very, very difficult in the United States. Abortion, capital punishment, and guns. And after next week, when we're talking a lot about human beings and their brains and how we, are, we tend to make mistakes, there's nothing like any of those topics. If you were to take capital punishment and add mistake, or abortion and add mistake, or guns and add mistake, and all sorts of pictures might start to fill your head. So we're talking about life and death issues here, and we're also talking about them in terms of human foibles. So it's, it could be uh, hard at times. And I'm hoping that through doing practicing this, and certainly anybody can make a claim here and um, the, uh, 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 defend a position, and that is welcome. The idea is to try and get the ideas, many, many ideas out. Um, and so I hope that we get to have some interesting disagreements here. And, uh, but, we're, but, to, but to set the stage, let us go back to Machiavelli. So I got this title, Good Clash, from a f passage in Discourses on Livy. 
And he says, okay, I'm tempted. Wesley, can you see that back? From, can you read that? Yes. Yeah, and people in the back can read it. Yes. Wesley, do you want to try reading it out loud? I'm totally putting you on the spot. Uh, good examples of government arise from good education, good education from good laws, and good laws from those <laughs> clashes which so many rashly condemn. Right, right. First thing that we think about clash is it's not very nice. No, 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 no. We don't want to hear what you have to say, especially uh, if we are, for the most part, hanging out with people who just think the way we do. But Machiavelli says you want to make sure that you have clashes, and that means substantive disagreement, in order to have better laws. So that is one. That's, how, that's what starts the stage, why I came up with this title. But let me then give you another picture from that other school of thought, which is Aristotle. And Aristotle talks about deliberation less as a clash and more like a potluck. <laughs> it's a much friendlier, much friendlier term. Um, can everybody read this? Yeah, is there anybody else who likes to read out loud? I've put Wesley on the spot. He didn't even know I was going to do this. Is there somebody over here? I know Shoshana. Oh, and then Elizabeth. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Deliberation is like a uh, dot, dot, dot. The many, when they meet together, may very likely be better than the few good. Keep going. Just as a feast to which many contribute is better than a single, than a dinner provided out of a single purse. Right. So if you want to make a decision, you want different things to come to the table. Uh, and um, so deliberation, we could call it a good clash, which is how Machiavelli talks about it. Or we can use a nicer term, which is deliberation. And we're going to get lots of ideas here. And a potluck. Who doesn't love a potluck? Isn't Wyndham County like potluck capital of the world? <laughs> I know Putney is. Um, Aristotle says that deliberation elevates the masses. And this is really big, because in the United States, um, we may say that we have a democracy, but guess who actually makes the decisions? Every single political decision in the United States, I want a hazard, is made by X. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Who makes all decisions? Yeah, Wesley. The majority? That would be true if we believe that democracy really meant <laughs> rule by a majority. But we have a specific kind of democracy. Anybody else want a hazard? Yes. Uh, can you tell yeah, us your name? representative democracy and the, <clears throat> the rules are made by elected officials. The, uh, and can you tell us your name? Steve. Steve. So Steve says that it's a, a representative democracy and therefore the rules are made by elected officials. That's a good answer. No. <laughs> what kind of a democracy do we have? Yes, it's representative. I'm, I'm giving you some clues here. Yes? Uh, Mary Alice. People with money. People ah. with money. That would be one way. I don't know. I'm looking at my document here. So, yeah, so Wesley, what do you think it is? So who decides with the Constitution? The Supreme Court. Every single thing that we're, sorry, every single thing that we talk about today the decision has been made. Anyway, the Constitution um, is decided by the Supreme Court. And so if we're talking about guns or abortion or capital punishment, the decision has been made. And it was made by um, the Supreme Court. So rather than have a democracy that um, is really the, uh, the majority makes a decision, in fact, it is the Supreme Court. Uh, so Aristotle, and if my machine would tell me, I don't know why it did that. Um, anyway, machines. What, what Aristotle would tell us is that if you get a group of people together and you ask them to think about something, hard, that they will actually make better decisions, or at least as good as the elites. 
Um, so this is a big deal, the fact that if we come together, according to Aristotle, and actually spend time talking to one another and hearing different viewpoints, we can make better decisions than the elites. In the United States, every, to Tocqueville said this famously, every political decision or political question eventually becomes a legal question. And we see that. The movements, yes, they are going to be protesting in the streets. But you know they're also going to be working through problems um, going through the courts. What's just happened in Georgia where the legislature passed uh, something around once there's a heartbeat, yeah. then a, a abortion becomes illegal. Well, that is a strategy that is being used to actually get it to the Supreme Court in order to take down Roe v. Wade. So we can count on that. That's the game we play here in the United States. The yes, we have a democracy and we have people who are deliberating and trying to make some decisions uh, together. But by the same token, we also have the Supreme Court and that makes our decisions for us. All right, so for Aristotle, uh, and this is hard to read, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So we had better be deliberating often, otherwise we are not going to be very good at this. So if we're not talking to people that we don't agree with, we're not gonna be very good at this. Um, and so it's not enough just to have the potluck, you gotta also be um, looking at how you got to be practicing doing that. That's part of your muscles. So uh, uh, opposite of Aristotle, then we get back to Machiavelli. And he has no sense necessarily that we're going to become more virtuous in the way that Aristotle does. He does think our survival rates go up. So if virtue is not your thing, another reason to think about why you want to have good clash is you're going to have more chances of survival. A wise prince will consider all the circumstances that can befall an army. <coughs> Through continuous deliberation, nothing unforeseen for which he might have no remedy would ever occur in battle. So here's just a completely self-serving, forget about nobility, a self-serving understanding of why you want to deliberate. Because maybe you're not on your way to battle, but certainly the world is precarious enough, uh, Sheldon mentioned climate change, that we might be thinking about ourselves the same way Machiavelli did, which is life is uncertain. Fortune is going to change things in ways we cannot anticipate. Things will probably go very, very bad. However, if we're able to talk to many different people, we are going to do a better job in these battles that confront us. Or if you like Aristotle, you'd rather have a potluck. And that's always fun. Okay. Um, but I wanted to let you know that there is a, a, a school of political theory in which deliberation and good clash, let's not kid ourselves. And maybe some of you all went to town meeting or maybe you've been to a public event in which people had to wrestle with a big decision and there was good reasons on both sides whether to buy a grader for the town, right? Good reasons on both sides. Spend the money on buying another grader for the road uh, or to, um, because the roads need it or taxes are too high. And what Hobbes says is let's not kid ourselves. Deliberation is not this lovely thing that Aristotle said. In fact, to deliberate is to reduce liberty. Because once you've made your mind up, the options are off the table. So actually, it's a funny word, deliberation. It's deliberating. People get all excited by it, but then they also know once you make a decision, it's hard. And definitely uh, around Act 46, where there's strong, strong feelings, every time a decision is made, people feel like, wait, whoa, 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 we got to back off on that. Uh, so th we're coming to a time in, in our history, I think, where we're having to deliberate about issues where in making a decision, we're gonna feel the dark side of it as well. A decision will be made, we've lost some liberty. Once a decision is reached, deliberators have fewer options. 
the deliberated action, says Hobbes. You can count on Hobbes to always be a bummer in the conversation. <laughs> He's the one, if you don't remember, uh, nasty, poor, brutish, solitary, short, that's the life of man. Um, so it's not a real optimistic guy. He's British. <laughs> He's also one of the few political theorists in the Western tradition who wasn't exiled, tortured, or executed by the state. So I don't know why he's feeling so bitter about things. Um, he says, though, that the deliberated action is not necessarily more reasonable or wise. Both Aristotle and Machiavelli, for different reasons, hold out this notion that we get smarter from deliberation. And Hobbes is not convinced. He says, it is merely the last appetite or aversion immediately adhering to the action or to the admission thereof. So maybe at some town meetings, I'm not going to say the Putney town meeting. I certainly did not see that happening. But have maybe you've been at a town meeting in which it just went on and on and on and finally somebody said something and that's what pushed it over the edge and three days later everybody wonders what did we just do i don't even know what just happened because we were talking 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 yeah myra brexit brexit yeah myra's right right brexit is how did that happen the last appetite or aversion Look at these passions. Everybody's equally dissatisfied. And everybody's equally dissatisfied, right. So deliberation, I mean, right, human beings, we're a mixed bag. Um, Hobbes was also very concerned about moral arguments. Men are so in love with their own new opinions that they name them conscience, as if they would have it seem unlawful to change or speak against them. And so here's this idea sometimes, and you know, I can be rather bland on an issue, and then somebody says something that I find is outrageous against it. Next thing you know, I am saying that God is on my side, and this is how it needs to be. So there's something about deliberation that can bring out a part of ourselves where we start to make these enormous claims. It's not just my opinion. It's conscience. And yes, that can sometimes be incredibly useful, but Hobbes says, be careful. Nick, yes? Let me just ask, if he, he says, uh, you know, once a deliberative body has made an opinion, that cuts out other options. But of course that's true if just one person, you know, a dictator is making a thing, which I know Hobbes thought dictators were quite all right. So, I mean, why does he say that? You'll, you'll lose your options once a decision is made. Right. It doesn't matter who or what makes the decision. Right. But that's right. So Shoshana is wondering about, you know, in some ways, because this is talking about deliberation, and let's not be, um, let's not treat deliberation as if it's going to be problematic because you lose your options when you deliberate. Whereas if you have a dictator, and, and Shoshana, although I would disagree with her on this, says that Hobbes was uh, in favor of dictators, I think he was in favor of order and security. And if an assembly of people, it doesn't have to be a dictator. So <clears throat> when I'm thinking about climate change, I for a while was thinking, well, if we had Al Gore and the generals, we might be able to solve this problem. <laughs> But the idea is, yes, deliberation and decision-making always cuts off your options. Right. Um, OK, so I'm going to push us on a little bit. Yes. Um, I, Steve. Steve. I, but e even, a, even a thing as big as the United States can change its mind, I think, of prohibition. Right. The options are not ultimately cut off. Ah, right? yes. Yeah. And, um, isn't it great how we have all these amendments? We, we look at something, there, the Fugitive Slave Clause, which is part of Article 4, gets overturned by the 13th Amendment. So we make, we, we do, we can change things. In the back. Um, maybe you're going to skip to Jefferson next anyway. I know yeah. Jefferson gave an awful lot of reading to uh, Madison, especially on the division of church and state, so that Madison actually got better at being able to describe the reasons why we have church and state. But the famous quote that probably a lot of people in this room know about Jefferson is that he said he would not keep dressing their children in the same clothes as they grew, 
meaning that nothing is written in stone, that societies change constantly and the rules that we had in the past aren't going to be the same. That's right. also reflected in the Supreme Court in what's called stare decisis, yeah. which means as it was, so shall it stay. And that's so I have to stop you just for a second because I need to, not everyone can hear you. Can you just tell us your name? Thad. Uh, so Thad is, um, and unfortunately I'm going to break Thad's heart because I don't have any Jefferson in this, in today's uh, uh, connection, but um, Thad is talking about how Jefferson, so part of the American experiment is not that you, you set something in stone and then it um, handcuffs us to those decisions, that we have many mechanisms in order to change the decisions we've made. And others have mentioned the amendments, um, and Thad was talking about Supreme Court decisions. There are, with starry decesis, there's a notion that there's not going to be a radical change. So <clears throat> the law tends to be conservative. However, um, there are elements where we can make some changes. So I'm going to divert us from that, though, and take to one of the key pieces why deliberation is hard, and that is because of factions. And factions is something that the United States dealt with through design, by coming up with this constitutional system with separation of um, powers. So uh, James Madison wrote about this in Federalist 10, about the evil of factions. And I would just spend a tiny bit on this, and then we're going to keep going. But factions is what happened when a group of people come together, think they know what's right, and then they begin to insist that they are going to uh, solve all the problems for everybody else. So it doesn't have to be a, a minority faction. It can be a, ma a majority faction who are united by some common impulse of passion or interests, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. And that is something that I think when uh, Jesse is talking about protests and how people are wanting to stand up to, many times, um, especially recently starting with Occupy Wall Street and going further on, there's much more attention on the oligarch class and those factions. Or we'll get to some other factions in the past, but when you have a faction that's in charge, it can tend to diminish debate because it stops wanting to hear what other people have to say, which is contrary to the rights of others, and it can also be contrary to the actual good of the whole, which is sometimes what we forget when we're in big factional debates. We forget there even is a whole, and then God help us. So factions can be a serious problem. Um, one of the biggest proponents of deliberation, John Stuart Mill, came up with three reasons why you want to have good clash. And this will be very important to hold on to, especially when we get into hot button issues. Because mm -hmm. it's all well and good to get excited by John Stuart Mill and what he has to say about liberty when we're just talking about abstract things. And another thing to think about it when we actually get into the heat of it, into really, really hard stuff. Our opponent's opinion may possibly be true. Whoa. Can you even put that in your brain? Our opponent's opinion may possibly be true. That's the first reason he recommends deliberation in a good clash. Without good clash, our reasoning is incomplete. So this one may be a lot easier to digest. He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. So it's not that you're getting into a good clash necessarily just to surrender your viewpoint. It's to get it much stronger inside to understand uh, what it is you actually do think. And you can only do that if you talk to somebody who disagrees with you. The third reason, this was another one that's hard to swallow, good clash teaches us that the truth lies somewhere in between. Wow. 
It's close, right? And, and this is going to be some place where I know our president, may, in some of his terms, may feel like, oh, I, I'm not sure I can go that far when I put his voice in my head. And that may not be true of all of you. It may be some other political uh, uh, operator who will say something, and, and it's like, no, 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 there's no way that the truth can lie in between. Conflicting doctrines share the truth between them. This is a classically liberal viewpoint. And I mean liberal in the sense of allowing everybody liberty. It means taking free speech very seriously, freedom to assemble very seriously, and that there's something about the clash itself that gives us a piece of truth that we wouldn't get if we didn't do that. It's so hard, says Myra, to have an open mind. She thought she was just whispering that, but that is exactly, you, you have now gotten your money's worth. Yes, Oliver. Um, this presupposes that literal is this uh, uh, unadorned good, mm -hmm. and that there are some people who totally reject that. So when I, this is a lovely thing about being a political theorist. What Oliver asked is, this assumes that liberal is some good. And, and there's not everybody who's going to assume that that's true. Absolutely right. Um, so I am, I am saying that this is classically a liberal argument in that it's based in liberties. Now, there could be moments where everybody does not believe in liberties. And, will say that's ridiculous. We certainly saw that after 9-11. There was a great willingness to give up of our liberties. And, and the argument was that we needed more security. So we had to surrender certain liberties. Most democracies have to deal with that all the time, especially if they feel under attack. So when I'm talking about liberal, I mean a way of framing a government that puts rights front and center. So I would see this document as being a liberal document, the Constitution. Um, but that doesn't mean that, and you may say that not everybody agrees with the Constitution, but that's the game we're playing. Maybe that's what I want to say. And um, Steve. Um, I, I love John Stuart Mill, but the problem I have with this is that he's using the word truth as if it were a singular. Mm. So we're going to hold on to this term of Steve who says um, as if truth is singular. And I'm willing to say maybe there's going to be multiple truths, but I just want you to hold on to this idea that through conflict there's going to be something essential in the midst of it. Okay, even with highly contentious issues. Every opinion which embodies somewhat of the portion of truth which the common opinion omits ought to be considered precious with whatever amount of error and confusion that truth may be blended. So we're taking all these different opinions and we are thinking that somewhere inside them, so when we move to guns, we're going to say on one side of the debate there is something precious. On the other side of the debate there is something precious. Doesn't mean that you will necessarily change your viewpoint. But looking for the precious inside of both of them is key to this whole piece. And, and luckily, after the break, I'm going to give you an example of somebody who kicked ass at this. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe I won't let you know who that is yet. <laughs> because we're getting near the break. Um, so, so this is pr pretty much what is going to be asked of each one of you as we go forward. Not to change your opinion, but to think that on both sides of a singular argument, um, that there is something precious in it. So any questions, thought? Anybody see a good clash again? Yes, Peter. I feel ultimately that your discussion is uh, philosophically it comes down to the defi definition of what is good. It's a philosophical question and everybody has his own um, feelings about the what's good and what's not. 
So Peter's question is that this is basically a, a philosophical conversation, philosophical discussion about what is good, and and certainly a legitimate legitimate thing to say. Although swords through my heart, Peter. <laughs> Political theorists do not think of themselves as philosophers interested in abstractions, but as pragmatic wisdom. <laughs> that this is actually going to be a useful way to address an issue. Not as, I'm, I'm not, you notice, I do not define the good. The closest probably that we came to some definition of the good is in which we understand the good as the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Anybody know what the permanent and aggregate interests of the community are in the United States? Life, liberty, and happiness is what David says. I'd buy that one. Pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness. Do you, Peter, do you want to say why that is important? Well, we don't have a right to be happy. We have the right to pursue happiness. We have the right to pursue happiness, yep. Um, that's all. It, it, where, does that, where does those words show up? Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence, yeah, that could be that's a useful the thing. Place. They're not in the Constitution. Ah, Peter notices they are not in the Constitution. Okay. I was counting on your crowd. Okay, I did tell the Marlboro students, we had just read Federalist 10. I asked them, what are the permanent and aggregate interests of the community? They couldn't tell me. They said it depends on who you ask. Everybody has a different idea of what the good is. How can you tell us? I said, I'm gonna go see the Osher people and they're gonna nail this. <laughs> what was I thinking? Anybody know what, it, what our permanent interests are? I know, look, I'm picking up my constitution again. This is a really great occupation for people who, who actually can't hold too much in their brain at the same time. This is very short. You notice I'm going to recycle these theorists again and again and again. I don't have to read recent people doing this line of work. So what is it? What are our permanent interests? What is our good? Yes, Thad. So, uh in the book Sapiens, one of the things that they discuss is the, uh, the fact that all language comes from gossip. In fact, gossip is so common that it's about 80% of what we talk about in anything, even scientific cases. So wait, 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 Thad, i got to stop you. Thad is trying to convince me to gossip. No, what I, my main point is, is, is that one of the things that you're talking about right here is the need for those of us who are extroverted to say what is the good. Mm. We all need to say what is the good and that just manifests itself <coughs> within gossip. Uh, Thad is trying to convince me, I'm not at all convinced, that we just need to say what the good is as part of our, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that that's incorrect, obviously. We have a, a need as a, as a society, as a social group, to state what is the good. So we know what the norms are. But people, I thought you were going to be able to do this. I thought you would be able to tell me what the actual good is in the United States. Yes, the hand in the back. Uh, yeah, Bob. I, I think basically the freedom to be able to speak as we are right now amongst ourselves and to speak our minds without fear of anything other than, you know, we can disagree amongst ourselves, but the fact that we can actually speak in a forum such as this yeah. and feel free without being, you know, shot or, you know, basically someone saying you can't do this. I think right. freedom to get together and to speak is, is one of the basic things. So Bob says to be able to do this, this is a, a, such a tangible, such a practical, I want to say, Peter, good that we are able to actually do this. Obviously, Peter felt a little good and felt like he could say this. Um, you also know that I'm fishing. Yes. The permanent interests are to have the means to exercise your freedom. Is your name Howard? I thought that was Howard. Um, so Howard says it is the means to exercise your freedom. And so if you don't have the means to exercise your freedom, what Bob was talking about, we don't have it. Okay, we're going to have to take a break because nobody's said it yet, although you think you can. Yeah? I tried. Because you're holding that little book, I would say upholding the Constitution. Which tells us what our good is. In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, Ensure domestic tranquility, 
provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. That's a nice one. With your means, you know, your concern, Howard, about means, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty, as Bob was talking about, to ourselves and our posterity. That's all. That's our good. We've got it. It's not individualized. It doesn't need to be deconstructed. That's what we need to do. And so when we are engaged in a faction and we forget that, then we're running into trouble. So we're going to take a break, and uh, then we'll get back to it. And I will tell you about this kick-ass person who took care of it all on her own. A little more Machiavelli to start with. Um, although, actually, that's not true, because we, the first part was theory and legitimate concerns about the use of certain concepts, such as the good or the truth. Yes, that is what philosophers spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, they can be useful terms as we're trying to figure out what it is we're after, what we think is true. Um, but I want us to now switch to a certain moment in time when a rather amazing political theorist, somebody who I think deserves a lot more attention, Jane Addams. Jane Addams has a, oh, do we have some fans? Jane Addams fans? Yes. Um, we do have a local connection to Jane Addams. Carmelita Hinton worked with Jane Addams at Hull House. Carmelita Hinton started uh, the Putney School. So we have some of the progressive, and when I mean progressive, I mean that, that time in, in the United States when a group of intellectuals and pragmatic thinkers, such as John Dewey, got together to try and solve some of the enormous problems that were going on. And at that time, a lot of the problems had to do with class clash. So um, I wanted to focus after the break on this very specific incident and how Jane Addams responded to it. The Pullman strike came about because of a terrible recession in, I have to look at my notes, 1893. In 1893, there was such a recession that George Pullman had to cut wages. Now, George Pullman is not your ordinary boss. He did not just provide jobs. He also provided entire lifestyle. He set up a town in Chicago in which the workers were given great places to live, state-of-the-art housing. They were also kept very, very clean. He was particularly interested that his workers did not live in the same kind of, and I can use this term, I think it's a descriptive term, slovenly conditions that the tenements were. So he wanted to give people a pathway out of the tenements, so he created this great place for them to live, had a nice store, had, took care of all their needs, and it was very, very clean. So when the recession happens, and all of a sudden Pullman cannot bring in the same amount of money that he used to bring in, he solves the problem by dropping wages. But he does not change rent. So here are the workers. The rents are high. The wages are low, and they are getting crushed. Uh, Jane Adams looks at this, and so um, it's not just that the workers are crushed, the workers go on strike, the federal government comes in, not too surprising. I think somebody you know, alluded to the fact that oftentimes do we have a democracy who's really in charge, seems like the wealthy seem to be in charge, and yes, there are many instances in the United States when the um, corporate power, maybe I'll use that term, was able to avail itself of state protection in order to preserve its assets. So that's what happened in Chicago. Really, really brutal strike. Um, a brutal strike and a brutal response to the strike. So Jane Addams looks at this. And she wrote an essay. And you may disagree with Jane Addams, but I want you to watch her technique, because I think it's so fascinating how she took what was a, what was a terrible clash in the sense that um, a lot of people were dying. People just wanted to go back to raising their families. That wasn't going to happen. 
So everything is disrupted, and uh, for the most part, the country is with the workers and not with George Pullman. So Jane Addams looks at this clash, and she writes an essay, The Modern Lear, based on Shakespeare. She calls him a misguided philanthropist. So her first step she makes in this, and there's a lot of people that, Jane Addams is living in Hull House in a section of Chicago where uh, immigrant families are coming in. If, you, if you've never read 20 Years at Hull House, I highly recommend it. It's a great story about this young woman from Illinois, rural Illinois, who decides that her life is worth nothing. She's a college graduate, although at the time they didn't actually give women bachelor's degrees, and she's studied Homer, she's studied Jefferson, she's studied Lincoln, she adores Lincoln. Her father knew Lincoln, he was a state uh, representative in the state of Illinois, and um, she is so depressed at what it is to be a college student, to have all these ideas and never do any good in the world. Uh, so she starts Hull House. That's the backstory for the settlement that she set up in Chicago. Um, so she calls him a misguided philanthropist. And she's speaking to a whole class of people that has started to develop at this time. Andrew Carnegie, um, Mellon, I forget Mellon's first name. All, who is it? Andrew. Andrew Mellon, thank you. All of these people who have decided that the most important thing that the United States actually needs is libraries, which is great. New York Public Library was started by a philanthropist. Beautiful building. If you've, I gather there's a great Netflix thing, Ex Libris, about the New York Public Library. Philanthropists gave money for concert halls, for universities, for colleges, to have cultural life. So she sees uh, Pullman as being a philanthropist, but he was a misguided philanthropist. So long as philanthropists are good to people rather than with them, they are bound to accomplish a large amount of harm. The problem that George Pullman made was he created this lovely town. He never asked the residents what they wanted. He was very beneficent with all the cleaning services. He never asked them if that was their highest priority. He never took the time to listen to them. So he, she saw him as a figure who um, was worthy of, okay, here's the term. She assigned good motives to him. Big piece. Assigned good motives to him, but said that he failed because he didn't follow this very, very basic principle of philanthropy. She saw him as having a tragic role. The social passion of the age is directed toward the emancipation of the wage worker. So Adams is not of the mind that the philanthropist, the industrialist, is some noble character. She's not, and at the time there was a lot of arguments about if you, had, if you were wealthy, it must be because you were righteous. Uh, Herbert Spencer, uh, social Darwinism. This is a time when the people who did have a lot of money had come up with all sorts of reasons why that was right. And they were talking about capitalism in a very specific way that seems to have really caught on uh, still. But it was this understanding that if you made your money, you deserve to have your money. But she saw the times in the United States as not being with the industrialists anymore. Because the country saw what happened in Chicago and they were actually a lot more sympathetic to the worker than they were to George Pullman. But he didn't see this. One of the problems with Pullman is he did not read the situation. He thought he had all the answers. He had all this money, he was making all this money, and he was going to solve the problem for all these families that had been living in terrible, terrible tenements. And if you've, um, it's not enough maybe to go to the Tenement Museum in New York City, although if you have, you could see how tightly packed people were, but there were no garbage services. The garbage was, you know, uh, feet deep. 
Jane Addams, one of her things she did is she just went around cleaning up the garbage out of the streets in uh, Hastings Street where she lived. So this, the tenements they were not only smelled terrible, disease ridden, so he had a noble motive there, but he just didn't read the situation. He should have allowed the workers the means for self-expression and made the town a growth and manifestation of their wants and needs. So this is a big shift. Seeing the good motive and being able to see exactly where he messed up. And for her, just like Bob, a key piece is going to be self-expression. The people should be able to, whatever circumstances they're in, they should be able to say, hey, this is great what you're giving me, George Pullman. I love my new bedroom. It's fantastic. So much cleaner for my kids. But you have to listen to me. I am part of this community. And she just went after that piece. By the same token, okay, so if, if Pullman is Lear, who are the workers? If you know this tragedy, King Lear. Who, yeah, Peter. Yes, the youngest daughter, Cordelia. Why do you think it'd be Cordelia? Because she loved him. She, she really didn't do anything wrong. She was just doing the best she could. Ah, so there would be, and, and Peter's talking about, this is a story of King Lear, where the daughter, Cordelia, is asked, to tell her father how much she loves him. And she says, no, 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 no. I, I'm going to tell you how much I actually love you. I'm not going to dress it up the way my sisters did. I'm not going to give you this exaggerated sense. So, so yeah, we could see Cordelia and the workers maybe is fulfilling the same role, in which case the workers are all good, right? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, we should see how Jane Addams treats the workers. Because it's not going to be a good clash if one side is angel and the other side is devil. Uh, she sees the worker's tragic role. The emancipation of the working people will have to be inclusive of the employer. Whoa. Do we think that way anymore? From the first, or will encounter many failures, cruelties, and reactions. So the workers, if they actually want to have their revolution, and so um, Jane Addams uh, worked with a lot of socialists, worked with a lot of anarchists in Chicago, also worked with a lot of Christians. She was always a little like, I love all your ideas, but I'm not going to subscribe to any one of them. She did seem to subscribe to tragedy. <laughs> so she said the workers, like Cordelia, didn't realize how vulnerable her father was. So there's the peace with Cordelia. Um, Cordelia failed to include her father in the scope of her salvation and selfishly took it for herself alone. Now, that's quite a statement to make. If you're working along class antagonism, you owe the industrialist nothing. Jane Addams says you actually need to give the industrialists a role at the table, a seat at the table, in order to go forward. Otherwise, um, it, it's not going to work. So um, our liberation depends on good clash. Um, the fact that she's focusing on tragedy feels very important. Because this is a tragic circumstance we all find ourselves in, each of us with our ideas. Tragedy shows us how we harm ourselves when we do not work to save our opponents. Again, these are, this is not statements that you hear in partisan America. Uh, you can hear it from Gandhi, not surprisingly, or Leo Tolstoy would be somebody else who might make this claim, that you cannot engage in a conflict unless you see something precious in your opponent. I'm using Mill's term now, not Gandhi's. But that's got to be what the struggle is. Um, and here's that piece where motive is so important for Adams. If we don't recognize the decent motives, 
however confused and mistaken, there's your way out. You may not agree with somebody, but you say, okay, your motives must be good. And they may be confused and mistaken, but unless we recognize that in our opponent, we shall not be free. That's a, it's a real high bar that she's asking of us. We have to ascribe good mo mo motives to even the industrialists after a horrible strike in which there was a lot of bloodshed, there was no justice for the workers until things started to turn around. So um, this, oh, it, it's interesting, okay, right. Um, that article that she wrote, The Modern Lear, she sent it to a lot of people. One of them was James, uh, John Dewey, good friend. He said it was one of the greatest things he'd ever read, both as to its form and ethical philosophy. Dewey was a big fan of this piece, The Modern Lear. The essay avoided harm by saying exactly the things that must be realized if the affair is going to be more than a disgusting memory. So I just want to hang out there for just a moment. We haven't had, unless, I, I mean, we have these tragic, tragic events, such as uh, the slaying of Michael Brown, and then the names start to go of unarmed black people, not just men. And so we have seen horrible, horrible tragedies. And we've also then turned into our camps such as the side that gets worried about how cops are going to do their job anymore and the Black Lives Matter. When we talk about the harm that happened in Ferguson, and that's getting a lot of attention, I think, because we're coming up to an anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking about it and we are reinforcing the factions, then we are making it harder for us to be free as a country. It's really scary, though to start to say, can we talk about it as a tragedy and then actually uh, resolve it? Not resolve it by making it better, but recognizing how we need each other in order to make it better. Did anybody happen to see that in Ferguson they, they performed Antigone? So there's a theater company that does staged readings of, and they go to the classic text, to ancient text, and they did a reading of Antigone in Ferguson, which was so powerful. Uh, there's the story of the body on the ground, if you know the play Antigone, and the, the, the sister wants to remove the body, and the king, Creon, says, you may not touch the body. And there's this terrible tragedy that happens about how are we going to deal with this body on the ground. Michael Brown was four and a half hours on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a gospel choir that was singing the chorus. You can find this online if you look in, uh, I think it's called Antigone and Ferguson or something of that sort. Um, it's amazing. In fact, maybe, um, ooh, I should, sorry I didn't bring it for us today, but I didn't want to have too much technology. I was wanting have more of a conversation. Uh, but this is this idea of can we get to the pain of the clash? Tragedy helps us to do that. And then to start to move forward. So, um, but not many people are really interested in tragedy when they're in the, in the heart of it. So when Jane Addams is trying to get this published, she sends it to many uh, editors. She sent it to Horace Scudder, who was editor of The Atlantic. She'd written for them before. And he, like many other editors, said, nope, I'm not publishing this. Can you guess why he wouldn't want to publish it? Did you want to say? No. Does anybody know, like, why? why? She's, written, she's written, I mean, the, the, the anger and the hurt and the confusion and the fear in America is very big right now around uh, struggles between industrialists and workers. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to publish this one. Because it, it wasn't on the... Uh, it wasn't saying that Coleman was 
It w because Lynn, Lynn Martin is saying is because it wouldn't say that Pullman was the enemy. And it, and it didn't say that the workers were out of control. Nobody would publish it. What? They like to divide. They like to divide. Well, or, you know, I, I, again, I, I'm always a little nervous to impugn motives, but somehow when it's divisive, everybody has to be divisive. And, and this may be getting to what somebody was saying about the need to find the good, and everybody says the same good, we need to express the good. It's like when we're divided, everybody has to be divided. We're social creatures. So Horace Scudder says, her argument fell to the ground because Adams assumed that Pullman's intent was philanthropic. She was not going to get published because she assumed he had good intentions. And if you're wanting to live in a divided world, you cannot assume that your opponent has good intentions. Nobody wants to hear that. So um, this essay, I think, has gotten not enough attention. Um, part of my, let's bring Jane Addams back. Let's, let's read the Constitution. Let's read Jane Addams. Uh, Gloria McMillan wrote something recently, and uh, she gives us some more terms that we're going to be able to use as we go further down this road. Adam's goal was never to give up on the generative process. Whoa, what do you think that means? Generative process. Do we have any examples? Like, what is a generative process? A creating process, right. Yeah, can you remind me your name? Nancy. Nancy. A creating process. What makes this creative? Assigning somebody who you disagree with vehemently. A lot of reasons not to have anything good to say about George Pullman. So can you say that again, Myra? Uh, so then there can be a discussion about the one side and the other side. If there's a generative process and you understand that things are being created and that our conversations are creative and then you're allowing both sides actually to actually be there, um, that's going to be generating more possibilities. Generate a generative process, it's like, right, it's opening up, it's seeing new possibilities. When we're not doing that, we're shutting down, we're reinforcing our factions. A generative process is always committed to the conversation. Never let the conversation flag or be abruptly halted by intransient, polarized factions. And that's really scary. There are many things that right now, my guess is it's very hard to talk about because you feel you will be aligned with a faction and that you will not be found on the right side of your neighborhood. That's very difficult right now. Bob is talking about how the freedom of being able to come together, and then we have to watch, or how are we letting factional interests make it harder and harder and harder for us to actually have conversations? Yeah, there's two, uh, Jesse. Well, it seems to me, since McMillan is saying <clears throat> Adams is rising above dispute, yeah. And she's giving credit to that for the superior analysis that I think we're lacking today. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me, while, while you say that the media won't have it if, if, they, if they are infatuated with the dispute or they're thriving on the disruption, but what would McMillan say about that? Or what is, isn't the generative process what we're really hungry for? Right, right. So I think, I think what Jesse's wondering about, um, and Jesse brought up about the media. So if the media is wanting to get more uh, clicks or whatever, or get more uh, attention because they're playing up the factional divide, then, if I'm hearing you correctly, but so how do we get this um, generative process going under these conditions? 
Yeah, I, I never met her before either. I just was Googling and seeing what people were writing about this essay and found out. Um, and Jesse also said that we're all hungry for the generative process. So we, we have a, a hunger for it and the conditions, particularly in social media and mainstream media, maybe, if I'm hearing people correctly, is going to make it harder to reach out and actually engage in this generative process. Yeah, um, Nancy. Nancy, sorry. It seems to me that we need to have, uh, uh, we need to educate ourselves on how to gather together and agree that no uh, swearing, no condemning, <coughs> no, uh, uh, do you see where I'm going? Yes. I'm running out of words, yeah. but bullying. The, the deal is that unless we can agree to disagree in a civil manner and allow something to come out of that, that we would not, we would, it, it's very hard to get ourselves so that we can generate, to have a generative process. So, so Nancy is talking about how we need to have certain rules of conduct, so no swearing, to treat each other civilly. Um, when I've given some talks at the library, uh, Putney Library, about deliberation, because we're deliberating our rights, um, mutual respect, to treat people with respect, is a very high point of this. To ask questions is something that others recommend, so that you get to find out why somebody thinks the way they think. So that can be a very useful way. Uh, Steve, you had your hand up. <coughs> For me, this is running us into questions about human psychology. When I was writing for a newspaper many years ago, I was told that my stories had to have a hook. Mm -hmm. And the idea, and, and it's, you know, the, the media is the way it is because of who clicks. And, and that we are interested in things that have blood yeah. or sex in them. Mm -hmm. um, and that in, unless we, we actually are talking about how human psychology works, what, what it is that fascinates us, um, then the politics becomes airy. Huh. So Steve is, is talking about how we, we, we need to understand human psychology a little bit more. And we are going to be talking about that next week, uh, where we're going to focus on cognitive. Is that me making that sound? I don't know how I did that. Anyway, um, or maybe it was God or something? I don't know. Was this like about cognitive dissonance? Wait, didn't I say dissonance and then the sound happened? Is there an intelligent design here or not? I don't know. Um, so, so next week we are going to talk a little bit more about psychology and, and that piece about it. But Steve's larger point is, and this goes back to well, human beings. We seem to want to blame others. We look for somebody else's suffering. We have this devilish side and we're always messing things up. So how are we going to get the generative process going there? Um, anybody want to throw in something? Myra, and then I'll go back to that. Just that focusing on that word intransigent oh. is so important mm -hmm. because I'm intransigent. <laughs> <laughs> So Myra says the key word here is intransigent, intransigent, and Myra confessed that she is intransigent. And my guess is that Myra is not always intransigent. But there are certain circumstances and certain conversations when you can just watch everybody hunkering down into their exact same, uh, into their corner mm -hmm. and wanting to go at the opponent. Uh, and this is a really, really hard thing to break. Yeah, Thad, thanks for being patient. I think that we're dancing around two uh, sets of phrases. One is grassroots, and the other is what appears in our dollar bills, which is e pluribus unum. Uh, and I think most people know what that means. But the point is, is, is that out of the many, we can uh, achieve our goals when we need to. In mm -hmm. this case, the Pullman Union actually made it a law that in all uh, public places, we shall have what Roosevelt used in his uh, speech before the Third Democratic National Convention. We will not discriminate for race, creed, or national origin. I won't go into the history now. You can look it up. But the point is, is 
that works. And the reason why I know it works is because I saw it happen with public housing. And the multi-millionaires, the, the son of um, Martha Graham, the Washington Post, who gave $5 million for public housing, and within five years that fell apart. Another public housing place was asked to, to uh, do things from the grassroots, ask all the stakeholders, quote, stakeholders, what they wanted. Do you, do you want a porch or do you want an extra room in your place? What color do you want the walls? Yeah. Guess what? The last time I passed by the place that was built by that, there's one in Lowell and one in Roxbury, I saw a black woman out on the street corner sweeping the street corner because she felt as a, a real stakeholder. So right. the grassroots, when you ask yeah. the masses what they want, you're going to get more of what everybody wants rather than what they need. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I'm going to have to condense for because the people over there, could you even hear what Thad was talking about? Oh, good. I'm so glad. But this idea that, uh, and in, when Jane Adams is saying to Pullman, your problem was you were doing things for people and not with the people. You weren't asking them what they wanted. So enterprises that have a lot of democratic buy-in do better, not from a theoretical viewpoint, from a practical standpoint, they just work better. The Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Boston is an amazing organization that was able to end, uh, to, to, to reclaim their part of Boston, which was going to be taken over by urban renewal and preceded by uh, lots of arson, dumping. Ways that if you want to take over real estate in a city, just dump a lot of stuff there, then you call it blighted, then you call it, oh, we need to take it over by eminent domain. So there's a whole process. And this neighborhood did it by talking to each other and getting everybody involved. The other piece that Thad mentions, which is super important, is from these horrible clashes, there can be enormously great laws. So this idea that sometimes there's blood on the street and then we get better laws, ideally, I'd like to say we wouldn't have to go down that road, but that is sort of part of this clash. And so the workers and the strike and then the terrible repression and America says, well, this is no, this isn't good. And we start to get some better laws. I'm hoping that we're right for just that kind of revisiting our laws right now, but it's going to take some suffering, perhaps. I don't know. There was a, Bob had his hand up. Oh, um, well, I I, was, I just wanted to say that, in my experience, the potential for generative conversation or process seems to occur most when some outside force kind of gets us all together. I mean, I think of our uh, Pearl Harbor, I think of 9-11, people who disagree in various factions coming together because of a common threat that brings them all together. And uh, to a point where there's an agreement that we have this common kind of threat, we're going to work together. Um, there's this, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else to go on to that. Um, now, I, oh, the other thing would be mediation, coming to, to agreement. If, if, if factions agree on some specific thing, if there's something you can find agreement on, like the, the cost of uh, prescription drugs or. Right infrastructure. I'm just trying to think of things that pretty much everybody who disagrees with each other can agree upon. Right. Then you you start to have the, the potential uh -huh. for for generative uh, creative right. yeah. thinking. Yeah, so Bob is talking about either either we're going to have a national emergency and that will sometimes bring people together, although it was so interesting with 9-11 how there was this moment of people wanting to come together and preserve what people felt was most precious. And then we quickly went into getting rid of our civil liberties. And we continue to seem to want to off, I don't know, get rid of uh, civil liberties. So there was an interesting piece of the coming together, how to take that moment. I'm interested in the idea of tragedy, if we can really hang out with the tragedy and not turn into we got to fix it, that that might be a way for us to hold on to what we have that's precious and not give up on that. Um, can I just move us along to another slide? So this generative process, uh, it reveals the thinking mind, not just the thought itself. It means that when you're having a conversation with somebody 
and you may strongly disagree with them, rather than getting stuck on the words they say, think about their mind as a generative organ. It's thinking. It's trying. It has moments of intransigence. For some reason, that word is hard. It also, and this is where tragedy, I think, is so important. Plays, fabulous, right? They give us the details. They set the stage. They have the actors. The actors are emotional. I'm looking at Shoshana. I love it when Shoshana is on the stage. Because it's just all of a sudden, it's not just Shoshana's words on the stage. It's Shoshana, and you can feel the inner life as well. It's amazing. So tragedy and thinking about these clashes as a tragedy helps us to find the human element. And um, this is understood in, this is what uh, Gloria McMillan says, a rhetoric of becoming. We go, to a, we go to see a play because first there's first act. Something happens. Second act. Although F. Scott Fitzgerald, I guess, said in America there are no second acts. <laughs> we may not be very good at what happens in the second act, which is when you really reflect on what just happened and you feel the tragedy of it, the unintended consequences, the misunderstandings. And then the third act should bring us to some greater understanding. Uh, sometimes with Hamlet, everyone's dead on the ground. And then the, the, uh, oppo the opponent, who's been waiting in the wings, Fortinbras, is able to easily take over the nation because everybody is self-immolated <laughs> through controversy, through a bad clash. Uh, I feel like Hamlet is so important for our time right now. Are we going to be a, a country that just goes after each other and then Putin can just waltz right in? And I know I'm speaking in these very nationalist terms. There's ways I could not do that. But this is a narrative that's very important, especially as we're moving up to another election. Um, so that this can be a way of perhaps not sh killing each other on the stage. Because we understand, oh, maybe Hamlet would talk to Ophelia. I'm making all these references to Shakespeare. I hope that's OK. <laughs> Um, but let me put, in the, and I definitely want to open this up to a larger conversation, so I'm, um, it's going to be, we'll stop doing PowerPoint very soon. There are other ways to think about this besides tragedy, and also beyond uh, class warfare, which sometimes is necessary, don't get me wrong. And that is America's other great tragedy, which is the relationship between descendants of slave owners and former slaves. So here's another great person, uh, James Baldwin, who talks about clash. Now, in a way that uh, is consistent, I think, with Jane Addams. And here's a, the piece about if we, and somebody was asking me over the break, like, what do you mean by we? What is this we? Who are we? We the people. So James Baldwin, he identifies his we. Uh, Wesley, can I put you on the spot again? A clash between lovers. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the others <clears throat> do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, Sorry. Rachel Nightmare, and achieve our country and change the history of the world. Sorry about that. Yeah. I think that's so powerful. Just Conscious whites, conscious blacks. That means anybody, right? It's going to require a disposition, I'm tempted to say. Consciousness is a disposition. 
And if we don't falter in our duty, we may be able to change this nightmare. Yeah. Lynn. I've been struggling with, I, I've seen generally, like on a small scale, you know, people are getting in the really big Uh huh. And can I tell, I'm going to tell people what you just said and then I want to hear what your clues are. So, because Lynn was wondering about, it's very, it's all well and good to talk about a generative process when you have a group of people who are coming together and it's on a small scale. We have a chance of trying to understand each other if the circumstances are small and we follow some of Nancy's rules of respect and, and civility. But what do we do, asked Lynn, when we're moving on to this bigger scale, especially when we're in such a polarized time? And Lynn said that when she heard that, when she saw this, she had a clue. What, what's, what's the clue, Lynn? And the, how, and the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, how does that help? Somebody else may want to. Yeah. How can we scale up? Myra's saying maybe to be aware of your actions. I mean, isn't that what it is to be conscious? Yeah. Thad wants to jump up. Oh, and then I'm going to go to you. Well, I think some of what he's saying is that when you're relatively conscious, you're relatively conscious of the world around you, you're more self actualized. If you see the big picture, and the best example would be why were we trying to blow each other up, Russia and us? Because in the long run, would Russia have been able to come over here and acclimate for everything that we had in this culture? Vice versa, if we'd blown up Russia and gone over there, we would have never been able to acclimate into their society. We never thought that big, and that's what's important, but I think more importantly is two quotes. One, and Walt Kelly, who said, we found the enemy, and he was like, the other one is that great joke immediately responded to by Gandhi, who was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? And he simply said, sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Could you all hear that, the, the two jokes, Walt Kelly, we've met the enemy, it is us, and, and uh, Western civilization, Gandhi says, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Um, you, you had your hand up. Well, I, I was thinking of relatively conscious in terms of being aware of one's own inner uh, attitudes, biases, and viewpoints with respect to the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you remind me your name? Judy. Judy. So Judy said that um, to, be, to be relatively conscious is also to be relatively conscious. So Thad gave us a big picture to be understand, understand our part in the whole. Judy is talking about how we need to look inside. What sort of um, biases might you have? Um, and that has certainly been the, ten, the trend lately, at least on college campuses, of a lot of work around identifying microaggressions um, and trying to figure out how to unpack white privilege. Personally, some of those things I find less useful the minute you call something a microaggression, you've assigned motive to somebody else. So I'm not sure it's going to actually help. But that idea of just being aware of our bias seems like that's going to be part of the consciousness. I think there was a hand. Yes, there. Uh, my name is Lee. Lee. And um, I was stuck at the um, insist on or create the consciousness of others. So isn't he saying call each other out? Yeah, like lovers, though. Right? So is, is that what you're seeing? Like what? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to have if you're going to have good communication, even if you don't agree on it, you have conversation, you have discourse. Yeah. And if you don't have the discourse, I mean, like, as if it's all we're all responsible for having that discourse in yeah. order to change the history of the world in order to be able to make the change. Uh huh. Is that too simplified? Well, I think what you're getting at is that idea that there is going to be some clash there, because insist on, you know, there is a, like a call out there. And, and to be willing to take, if I, I'm hoping I'm hearing you correctly, the, the willingness, 
if you're insisting on someone to change, you're also assuming they can change. That's an enormous difference in understanding. Um, and uh, I've a, a, always admired Huey Newton of the Black Panthers and his strategies in order to organize uh, the Panthers. By the same time, I, I'm not sure he could ever insist on white people changing. Because he, I'm not sure, could see white people changing. And then we have a problem of that we've lost the lovers. And Huey Newton has a lot of reason to be angry at white people, how he was treated by the, the police in Alameda County in California and the time he spent in the pit in Alameda County Jail. A lot of reasons to be angry, but the piece that feels different about Baldwin is that he's insisting that people can change and that we got to make this change. Steve wants to jump in. I'm sorry for making trouble again. Um, <coughs> A insist on or create is, is a one way, is, is uh, attributes to one person power to make something happen in somebody else. And as a, as a teacher, I find myself wanting much more to use a word like allow than insist on or create. Mm -hmm. and, to, uh, and there's the possibility that the others will not become, in my terms, conscious. Mm -hmm. and that, that to say that I insist on the consciousness of others is, uh, hmm. uh, I, I don't find that entirely de democratic. Uh-huh. Because you, you may not, well, I mean, Baldwin has an out for you, Steve. He would just say, well, you're not one of the members of the conscious whites. <laughs> I think Baldwin and I would probably agree about a lot of things. So yeah. I, I'm not afraid of that. Yeah. But I, I, just, I just mean that, this, that that if we call ourselves conscious, if any, mm -hmm. if any person calls himself or herself mm -hmm. conscious, mm -hmm. that there's already a, mm -hmm. a layering there, an implication that somebody else is less conscious. So, so I'm going to lay on, on Steve for just a, I'm not really going to get up and lay on you, Steve, don't worry. But I am going to press on this just a little bit, because we're talking about this in a very specific place. Um, there's one thing to say, oh, and boy, do we see this now in college campuses. Maybe you all see this as well. But there's a lot of performance of I have done my anti-racism tr training in uh, young white undergraduates. And I don't see, and, and I, I would agree with Steve, that that kind of, I want to show you how woke I am, can, is not, I think, what we're getting at here. But I'm so glad that you brought it out because I want to distinguish that from when you're in the midst of an encounter with somebody else and you start to feel that hardening of the neurons and you want to say something to prove them wrong, this, these can be antidotes to that muscle. So that's how I'm, I mean, and why am I offering Jane Addams and James Baldwin? It's to try and get our brains to say, Oh, are you like, I, maybe I, we need little uh, bracelets. What would Jane Addams do now? <laughs> what would James Baldwin do now? What if I took somebody who I'm having a very strong disagreement with, and rather than say they are a member of the opposing warriors, I say they are my lovers. Whoa. The people who most drive me crazy. After I read The Modern Lear, I tried it with somebody who's in the White House right now. I said, what if I think of this person as misguided and confused with good motives? And I just watch my own, okay, what we're looking for people here, I don't want you to think I'm gonna turn you into angels. No, 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 it's not gonna happen. But what we're looking for is something that starts to shift in your brain and you begin to feel like the generative process, not the shutting down process, is woken up in your brain. Is there anybody else? Because I'm going to turn to Thad unless there's somebody. Yes, right there. It, oh, are you? Hi, I'm Sue. Sue, yeah. I'm thinking that it's um, if someone's willing to sort of notice what's going on with themselves. Yeah. So <clears throat> what I liked about the relatively, too, was that you didn't have to be perfect. That you're just n willing to notice, to stop and notice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's that willingness to stop. Even sometimes it can just be that much to change the pacing. Uh, I was once at a, um, 
uh, Drug Policy Alliance uh, annual meeting, and the room was filled. And, and for the most part, drug policy activists are very, very clear about what they think is a person's responsibility with, in terms of drug use. So the line is absolutely nothing. If you're in a drug policy alliance and you're talking about harm reduction, the word in the group is that people who are using have absolutely no responsibility. So, and they said, well, I think people need to take more responsibility for the situation they're in. And the room went wild. Everybody wanted to show how they had no sympathy for that position whatsoever. And the woman who was reading, leading the panel, she just said, everybody, stop. I'm serious. We're all breathing together now. Again, breathing together. I'm serious. <laughs> okay. We are now going to go back to the issue we mean to be talking about. And, and it was a way just of like slowing it down a little bit. Um, that. I would overlay relatively conscious with collective consciousness and television. And I think it's a real shame that James Baldwin is alive to this day because we actually did give larger clothes to our children, as Jefferson talked about, and that is that through television, we were able to make it safe for people to be gay and then get married. He had been alive long enough to see that, mm. to see the fact that, my God, you know, there's people that are, I didn't, didn't realize they were gay and the end of the world didn't get here, we didn't all go to hell, mm -hmm. it's okay for them to get married, we changed. We Gotten close. Mm. Baldwin was the business about love right here, and this mm -hmm. is what he's involved with other people mm. else in his private life. It would have been really great for him to be able to see us change to the point that we're allowing for people to be freely in love with each other of the same sex. So that is talking about because James Baldwin was gay and um, that how things have changed is now possible for people to actually get married. Um, and that Thad is crediting television for doing that. And if you want to see great James Baldwin, if you YouTube videos of his date that he did with William F. Buckley Jr. Uh, on the um, Does the American Dream Come at the Expense of the American Negro? Baldwin is amazing. Uh, poor Buckley. <laughs> Yeah, he's pretty well eaten up and spat out, but, uh, and Baldwin wins the debate by a margin of about 300 to zero, I think. Um, but the, the idea, and I think Thad's point is important, that sometimes it's very easy to feel like we can't scale up. I think Lynn's question about how can we scale up, we can imagine something small. Well, if something gets televised that's small, that can be a way of scaling up. If we stay with the human and the details and then scale up, that may, could be a way to do it. <laughs> Is there anybody else who has a question, maybe who hasn't spoken, who's been wondering? Yes, I Judy. I just wanted to add before we leave James Baldwin, Baldwin that I believe that within the next two weeks, uh, PBS is going to be broadcasting uh, The Native Sun. Oh, Judy believes that PBS is going to be broadcasting The Native Sun, which is by Ralph. Richard Wright. Richard Wright, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I was thinking about um, Jane Addams yeah. and why she wasn't getting published. Mm. What she wrote was difficult. It's not flashy. Right. You know, it's not going to grab people in their guts and yeah. it's really, it's This is challenging stuff. Yeah. It's really. And can you say your name? Janet. Janet. So Janet is, is talking about, and this is what somebody else was mentioning in terms of the media, that um, it's hard to get this kind of voice out there. So Jane Addams, Janet is recognizing, was having a hard time getting published. It's very hard to, to take that position that's not just angry, outraged, indignant. And not to say those are bad emotions. Don't miss, don't, uh, please. I'm not asking for people to whitewash conflict. I actually think conflict, I, I believe in good clash. And the, and the trick is to somehow do the good clash 
and then allow for us to have a container that's slightly bigger than the clash itself so that we can step back and look at it and learn from it or slow it down. Yeah. Yes. And oh, um, Larry. it's Larry. Yes, thank you. So I was, I'm absolutely with all of this, but I have a faculty devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. I really feel, certainly in my gut, that when I try to attribute good motives to the present occupant of the White House, mm -hmm. I'm moving the moral goalposts. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm sort of saying, Things that used to be morally abhorrent mm -hmm. behavior and values are now, and that doesn't feel good. Right. And I think Larry just got at the heart of it. So what Larry said is, I try to um, assume good intentions. Am I right? Uh, what you, you try to do yourself. Right, with the current so occupant. Good Attributing good intentions to the current occupant of the White House. And Larry wonders, what happens to my morals if I do that? And I think that's really an essential question. What happens to mine, our or what happens to our country's morals if we do that? If we say we're going to create the container that's big enough for certain behavior. And, and that really is, that's the $64,000 question. Can we say, and, and um, I'm involved in the restorative justice um, movement on the board at the local BCJC, and it's very interesting when you go, and this is all the same with drug users or with people who have committed serious crimes, and people in those groups are very willing to give second chances to think about restorative justice for people who have committed heinous crimes. If you ask that same people, and this was last summer, well, what do you think of Ashcroft? Or um, what do you think of um, the president? No mercy. So there's, there's like having to f try to figure that out. And, and I'm not going to answer Larry's question today. But I think that's the big one because we are out of time. <laughs> and we, next week we will come back and we'll be spending a lot of time working on our clicking sounds and also cognitive dissonance and getting into the psychology of all this. So thank you very much. <laughs>